Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Teleshadowing. We're live on YouTube. I know that today is a special Monday session. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat box as we go along and they will be addressed. I'm honored to introduce our mentor for today, Dr. Hussein. Dr. Hussein is a professor of surgery and pediatrics at the University of Utah Health, where he also serves as the chief of the section of pediatric cardiothoracic surgery. Dr. Hussein is also the co-director of the Heart Center at Primary Children's Hospital in Utah. He is very involved with humanitarian work, and he's the president of the International Palestinian Cardiac Relief Organization. Now I'd like to request Dr. Hussein to begin today's session. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, and I just, let me see, do you want me to? Sh yes, perfect. Well, I'm really appreciative for the opportunity to spend some time with you all this morning. Um, I hope that this will be an insightful experience I'm happy to speak with you more directly about the field of cardiothoracic surgery or pediatric cardiothoracic surgery, but I thought a platform to perhaps tell you about that as a profession or a subspecialty would be to share with you some of my thoughts regarding disparities in medicine across our globe and more specifically disparities in terms of how congenital heart disease is cared for in different parts of the world and tell you a little bit about some of the really fantastic experiences I've had and the benefits I've had on a personal level and in regards to my career development by being involved with humanitarian endeavors. So as a bit of a background, um, two or three points. One, congenital heart disease is statistically the most common type of congenital disease that a child can be born with. It's more prevalent than childhood cancers, more prevalent than childhood infectious diseases, and from an anatomic level, more prevalent than any other anatomic congenital abnormality that, that a child can be born with. A little over 1% of all children born in the world have some form of congenital heart disease. And depending upon what type of statistical source you look at, about a third to a half of them require some type of surgical intervention during their livelihood. So Clearly, it's uh, a defect or an issue that is quite prevalent around the world. The second uh, point that I would raise is that, as with other types of medical needs around the world, there's significant disparity, and I'll share with you some of the numbers involved with that. And then the third thing I'd like to share with you before starting is my involvement with the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund an organization is really one that is not predicated on any specific political, religious, or societal beliefs. Um, it was really uh, a gift uh, of serendipity for me. When I finished my training in 2007, and before I started my first academic appointment, I had some time where I was really interested in pursuing humanitarian work. And so essentially for lack of a more elegant historical description, through a lot of web-based searching, I came across uh, PCRF and uh, got to know its founder, a, a gentleman named Steve Sosabi. And he arranged for me to go to uh, Israel and go to Palestine and go into some of the occupied territories. And I was there for a month doing pediatric heart surgery. And that really was the springboard. And essentially I've gone back about 11 times to that region of the world since then for these humanitarian trips. And so it was really um, something that fell into my lap rather than something that I had a lot of historical understanding or passion about. So full disclosure on that. So um, why is this important to me? So this is a picture of my daughter. She'd be upset if I uh, shared with her that I showed this to you. Her name is Sophia. She's 12 years old. Um, she likes to play tennis. Um, she likes to tumble. Uh, she has several cousins that she's very close with, and she really has no health defects or, or medical issues whatsoever. And then this is my uh, son, Yusuf. Uh, it's a little bit of an older picture. He does have teeth now again. Um, he's nine years old. He's uh, really into soccer, into chess. 
and um, also into playing the drums. And so he's got a lot of diverse interests uh, and again, quite healthy. And if I was to be quite honest, both of these kids are pretty spoiled. They um, attend a school called Waterford here in Salt Lake City. It was found one. Uh, it's a private school. It's uh, very uh, diverse in terms of its socioeconomic and racial uh, background, which is something that's been very attractive to me as a parent. They have about 15 to 20 kids in each of their classes. So it's a small school and it's a preschool through um, grade 12 uh, environment. So um, this should be, uh, if things work out for them, their school for the long term. So it's a lot of stability for them. And it's a pretty idyllic, protected environment for them. So this is a young girl, Malak Abusar. She uh, lives in Khan Yunus, which is in the southern part of the Gaza Strip. I met her back in 2019, right before the pandemic. She's got three siblings. Her father is not alive. And she has what's known as a canal defect or an atrioventricular canal defect. So she, prior to me meeting her, had a hole between her ventricles or the pumping chambers of her heart. She had a hole between her atria or the collection chambers in her heart. And rather than having four good heart valves, she only had three. And essentially, rather than having two inside of her heart, she only had one. And so she was in a lot of trouble in regards to heart failure symptoms, inability to run and play, and clearly had a shortened lifespan ahead of her without any type of intervention. And then this is Zakaria Balkik. He's eight months old when I met him, same trip, 2019. Four siblings, lives in Gaza City, and he has a heart defect called Tetralogy of Fallot, meaning he has a big hole between his pumping chambers or a ventricular septal defect. And he also has significant narrowing in his pulmonary outflow tract. So when his right ventricle is trying to squeeze unoxygenated blood to his lungs, there's significant narrowing in addition to an abnormal pulmonary valve. And so over time for a child like this, they get to be quite blue and cyanotic with low saturation levels. And this is an area of Khan Yunus, very close to the hospital that uh, I've been to. I've gone to this hospital now for the past four or five years. And we have a trip planned actually for September of this upcoming year to go back uh, politics and uh, COVID willing and able. Unfortunately, we haven't been back since pre-COVID and the other stark sad piece of information regarding that is there has been no congenital heart surgery that's been performed in the Gaza Strip for over two years. And so there have been several fatalities and deaths, unfortunately, in kids that could have some type of heart surgery but haven't received any type of care. So 93% um, is a pretty stark number, and it's what the latest data shows in terms of the percentage of children around the world who have congenital heart disease, who have some anatomic or physiologic substrate that would require intervention that have no access to that intervention, which I think is pretty profound. It's a higher number in terms of disparity than kids around the world that are afflicted with HIV, that are afflicted with other immunocompromised or infectious disease disorders, that are afflicted by any type of hematologic or oncologic or cancer type congenital defect or problem. And so it's a big number. And if you think about babies being born around the world that have a medical problem that requires attention, and only 7% of those children have access to that intervention. That's a pretty sobering statistic in terms of the disparity that's out there regarding congenital heart disease. So uh, my surgical ex experience in Palestine, and I, I, I share all this with a lot of humility uh, because these trips are really the product of a big team. We usually take about 11 to 12 people with us when we go on these trips. Um, they come from different backgrounds. Um, they come from being uh, parents and, and having family responsibilities themselves, yet they 
uh, invest uh, 10 to 14 days on a trip where they travel to a place they've never really been before, or if they've been, it's a repeat trip for them. And so a lot of these experiences are the product, like I said, of a very large commitment of several people to create a team to go over there. So I've been to the West Bank on five trips, and this slide's a little outdated. I've been to Gaza uh, on five trips now. And over my trips, uh, we've performed 118 operations, a uh, little typo there, uh, 68 males and 50 females, 20% that we've operated on are neonates, meaning less than one month of age. The average age of the child we've operated on there has been just about two and a half years. And the, the spectrum has been as young as three days of age up to 12 years of age. So a lot that goes into these uh, trips, uh, programmatic planning, constructing your team, scheduling, a lot of logistics once you get there. Um, the average cost per trip to include all the airline tickets, to include all of the uh, uh, disposable equipment that we take with us for the surgeries, as well as just general incidentals is about twenty to $25,000. And the average number of children we treat are about 10 to 15 surgical procedures. So the cost per child is only about $1,750, which is pretty remarkable when you think about really the fiscal realities of healthcare in a place like the United States or Canada. To give you perspective, when a child has a straightforward VSD closure here in the States or a closure of a hole between their pumping chambers, the costs of that for the hospital are usually in the ballpark of about $100,000 to $150,000. And so this gives you some perspective about how different things can be when you explore it or examine it or tackle it from a different financial perspective. So the Gaza Strip, which is where we've gone the last five times and where we're scheduled to go in September, Again, for several of you, this is not a, a political lecture, but to give you just some factual information. Um, there's about 2 million residents now in Gaza uh, as of 2020, uh, and it's estimated to be about 2.2 million now in 2022. It's 25 miles long and it's about six miles wide. So a good reference would be almost like Manhattan. The Rafah border is on the southern part of the Gaza Strip, which is uh, near proximity to Egypt. And it's only open for about 17 days. Um, and um, this has been going on since April of 2018. So about 17 days out of the year that it's fully open. The Erez border is to the north with the Israeli border. And um, about 500 people were allowed in and out across the Erez border in 2017. Um, and 26,000 people had entered the Erez border area in 2000 to try to cross and were unable to cross. There is, in, um, in, in reality, a, a fairly um, present relationship between some of the hospitals in Tel Aviv with the European General Hospital. And at times of political normalcy, there are kids that are allowed to exit Gaza for medical care to go into Israel for medical care. But that usually is about 100 or so kids, 150 kids per year. And I'm not just speaking in regards to kids with heart defects, it's the totality of kids who need some type of medical intervention that are allowed a travel permit to cross the Erez border and to get into Israel and oftentimes go to Tel Aviv. So um, the average uh, annual income in 1994 was a little over 2,600 US dollars and in 2018 was a little over $1,800. There's a 44% unemployment rate. The poverty rate is about 40% which is twice that of the West Bank and 80% of the population is requiring some form of either financial, water or food or health care assistance. In terms of water sanitation, 97% of the households in Gaza depend upon water directly delivered by tanker trucks, meaning there's no wells or tap water that is adequate for use. 95% of the groundwater is polluted secondary to inadequate sewage maintenance systems. So again, most of the population, if not all the population, is dependent upon water delivery services.
For education, about 94% of the schools function on a double shift approach. So kids essentially go to school for half day shifts. So half the kids go to school from early in the morning till noontime, and then they leave to go home. And then a whole nother shift of kids come in to go to school in the afternoon time. Well over 500 schools were damaged or destroyed in the 2014 conflict. And about uh, 40 kids comprise the average classroom size. And based on the United Nations Fund for Population Activities data, there's a need for probably about 600 more schools within the Gaza Strip and at least another 18,000 more teachers. And, you know, these are just some standard pictures of the landscape of what Gaza looks like in terms of the challenges they have with rebuilding, with infrastructure, with construction overall. Um, in terms of healthcare, uh, before the Rafah closing, as I mentioned in 2014, about 4,000 crossed per month um, in, at the ERA's crossing for medical needs, about 54% of applications are approved, but all medications, all supplies have to go through either the Rafah or the ERA's crossing. And so they have to be approved in terms of that equipment getting into Gaza. The UN supports about 22 healthcare facilities in the Gaza Strip. In terms of electricity or power, there's usually upwards of three and at times four shifts per day where they have power. And the power shifts can be anywhere between four to six hours at a time. So there's several occasions where for eight hours or so, there may be no power in certain parts of Gaza. And in the past year, three hospitals and 10 medical facilities had to shut down due to a lack of sustained power. So I'm painting a pretty grim picture. And again, it's not to try to deliver any kind of political or religious message. I think these are just factual realities of what the unfortunate state of affairs is for folks and residents in Gaza, and more specifically for fragile kids who are um, really struggling to get the education and the health care they need. So this is a picture of a good friend of mine, Hassan, who's an anesthesiologist in the West Bank. And every time I've gone into the Gaza Strip, he's traveled with me into the Gaza Strip to do anesthesia for all of the cardiac surgery we do. I take this picture because he's putting a central line in this child's femoral vein, and we're essentially doing it with no power. Um, we're using iPhone lights to put our lines in. You see a monitor in the back there, and that's being powered by a generator. And we do this because we want to save the power that we have to only use during the operation itself. And so it's not uncommon that all of the pre-op preparation for a child, whether it be to intubate a child, to put lines in the child and get the child ready, will do without power on purpose to try to conserve power. So uh, this is a picture of Dr. Sun on the right sitting on the floor and Dr. Woodward, who is a doctor nurse practitioner standing up. When we arrive to Gaza, we stay in the nursing dorm on the medical and hospital campus. And we bring enough supplies for about 15 children to receive operations. And the first night that we arrive, we essentially create packets. So everything a child will need from the pre-op IVs to all of the in-operation cannulas for going on bypass, the instruments, the chest tubes, the pacing wires, to all of the things we predict they will need in the ICU that we set up from them in their recovery time frame, we create packets so that if we're gonna do two operations in a day, we take two big packets from the dorm over to the hospital. And so this is kind of a picture of those packets being created. So this is the operating room that we use when we're there. Um, it's actually an adult operating room. <coughs> <coughs> it's not designed for pediatric cardiac cases, but we convert it into a pediatric cardiac OR and we construct a bypass machine that we can use for pediatric cardiac cases. And this is the bypass machine that we use. Um, I have a perfusionist who lives in Los Angeles and works at Loma Linda University who has um, Palestinian ancestry. Her family is from Jordan, and every trip I've gone into Israel, Palestine, Gaza Strip, she's come with me, and she's really incredible uh, because she can essentially get into a hospital and use 
all of the equipment that we've left there from our last trip, essentially sterilize everything, test everything, and then basically construct a cardiopulmonary bypass circuit. So she's uh, exceptionally skilled. So this is just a general picture to, to give you some perspective. Um, this is us uh, operating on a, on a young baby. All of the tubing you see are the bypass tubing. So to take a step back, anytime you do an open heart operation, whether it be on an adult or a child, you have to put them on what's known as cardiopulmonary bypass. And what that means is you have to connect cannulas to different components of their heart and their lungs to drain their heart and lungs of all of its blood as it's coming back to the heart and lungs from the body. The cannulas drain all of that blood into a machine, the circuit that I showed you on the last slide. That circuit can do several things. You can infuse medicine into that circuit. You can control the temperature of the blood going through that circuit. You can control the rate at which the blood's being drawn from the body and the rate at which blood is being infused back into the body. So it's essentially creating a platform by which we can drain the heart, stop the heart and operate on the heart while the rest of the body is essentially receiving what it needs regarding blood pumping as well as oxygenation from the machine. So these are different tubings that are going to the bypass circuit. You can see the white towels. I think this picture is a little bit telling because you see some blood stains on those towels. In the US, when we do open heart surgery, all of the draping that we do is used through disposables, meaning it comes to a sterile. We open up the packet, we drape the patient out, we finish the operation and then we throw it away. <clears throat> Those types of disposables are very hard to come by in a place like Gaza. And so they literally launder and sterile all of their towels in between cases. And it's always a bit disconcerting because you get a drape that has blood stains on it and you worry about its infectious components, but the local team there assures you that it's been sterilized and cleaned. So. <clears throat> this just again gives you some perspective on the child size some of the sizes of the babies we operate on in terms of how small their chests are and the operations that we do <clears throat> excuse me so to give you some other perspective this is a picture from the icu at the hospital that i work at and all of these pumps with the green screens <clears throat> are different medication infusion pumps so that we can control the rate of medications that a child is receiving. The blue screen in the back is the ventilator. And it's a very high tech, highly functioning, um, technology driven approach to how we care for really sick babies after an open heart operation in terms of how we monitor them, how we control the medications they're receiving and really try to optimize the care that they're being rendered. And this is the uh, ICU in Gaza City that we construct. So we don't have enough room for individual beds. We take a big room and we put several beds in there. You can see the pumps, especially on that baby on the right hand side of the screen, the pumps are far outdated. The screens are far outdated and it just gives you a perspective of the difference. And the other interesting thing to note in this picture is up on the top of the picture on the ceiling is a big heater. So there isn't oftentimes central air conditioning or heating and they have these portable units in terms of trying to control the temperature. So why do we do this? Um, what's the purpose of doing all this? And I guess I go back to the original pictures. This is a picture of Sophia just pre-pandemic on a trip to London at the London Eye. And, you know, I think um, she's been pretty blessed in life. She goes to a really nice school. She has things taken care of for herself. And really her trajectory in life in many ways, in addition to um, whatever higher being you believe in and whatever value obviously there is in terms of family and parenting, her trajectory is going to be up to her. She's going to have all of the tools necessary to really maximize her abilities and skills. And it's going to be up to her to really evolve and mature into a productive contributing member to society because she's really been gifted so many foundational things. 
And I don't know what Malak's future is. I know that her heart's fixed, um, but, you know, she still lives without a father in a place that at very best she has to go to school in a shift type environment where the access to education, healthcare, and financial resources are extremely limited. And I think about Yusuf, and this is him on that same trip to London. We went to a Premier League soccer match. He's a huge soccer fan. And I think the same thing applies for him, like Sophia. I think trying to keep him grounded and balanced is going to be my job, but really his trajectory is going to be up to him because he's so fortunate to have all of the foundational needs to really create a pathway for himself moving forward. And I'm not sure what's going to happen with Zakaria. Um, again, I'm thankful that I think he's got baseline good health now with his heart being fixed, but he's got four siblings. He lives in Gaza City, very economically disadvantaged. And I'm not sure what his opportunities will be if he remains in Gaza for the rest of his life and is unable to obtain higher education and really move forward in other facets of life. So why do we do it? Um, you know, I think when you talk about disparity, it's factual. There's really little emotion. It's data. So when 7% of children receive the type of medical care they need around the world with something that, at least in America, we have high degree of success rates and significant technological and financial ability to treat, it gives you pause in terms of the factual angst of disparity. Humanity is more personal. Um, there's not really much data when it comes to humanity, but it's really the product of recognizing the imbalance and the disparity of existence and what one can do to contribute to perhaps narrowing that. Now, you could view it as being quite daunting. We've operated on 100, 150 kids in Gaza. Has that really changed the 93% level as it moved the needle? I'm not sure that it has, but has it impacted those kids? For sure. Has it created knowledge for a lot of team members that I've taken over and created a source of pride and a source of purpose for them? Absolutely. And so humanity is a little bit less black and white. And I think it's really more predicated on how each of us as individuals views our role, our responsibilities, and what we can do not only as individuals, but to create a platform of leadership for ourselves so that we can encourage others around us to think about humanity. Privilege. You know, I think my two kids have a lot of privilege. I think I have a lot of privilege. I think we all have a lot of privilege. The things that we think about on a daily basis that create profound stress for us are the sources of our frustrations, are the things that we think are being wronged to us. I think when you think about them from a perspective standpoint, it's not to be critical of any of you or even be critical of myself, but there is some perspective regarding privilege. And I think if I could suggest or submit to you at early stages of your career, I think privilege actually creates responsibility. It doesn't just create opportunity, it actually creates responsibility. And that privilege is something that in many regards has been a gift. Now, there's no question for those of you that are pursuing medical career pathways or non-medical career pathways, it requires a lot of hard work. It requires a lot of sacrifice and you all are doing those things. But that foundational privilege, I think, is a reality. And I think it's something that we should all consider to be a source of responsibility moving forward. Purpose. Regardless of where your profession takes you, regardless of where your personal life takes you and the ups and downs of both of those aspects of your life, I think if early in your life and then as you continue to grow in an evolutionary way for yourselves in a personal way, you define what your purpose is, it will likely give you a lot of strength to tolerate the imperfections of life, the challenges that you'll face and all of the uh, difficulties that you may have to navigate both in your professional and personal life. And so thinking about the value of what your purpose is and recognizing that whatever your purpose is today may evolve, but being thoughtful and mindful to take time on regular occurrences to redefine or reevaluate what your purpose is, I think can be a very productive endeavor. So I, um, 
I conclude with this picture. This is the picture of the team we took uh, just pre-COVID. It was in the fall of 2019. Um, and mostly just to thank all of these people in terms of their sacrifice and their willingness to leave their families and go to a foreign land and operate on children that they've never met before and likely will never meet again. But it's really always a privilege to find people that want to go create a team and then um, accomplish the things that we want to accomplish. So again, I don't know that I've been in line with some of your other mentors. I didn't dive deep into anatomy or physiology regarding cardiothoracic surgery or pediatric cardiac surgery, but I'm happy to do that. If you have questions in specific about career planning, career trajectory, or what a day in the life in the U.S. is for a pediatric heart surgeon, but I thought it may be a, an interesting exercise for you to learn a little bit about humanitarian endeavors and really the disparity of healthcare around, around the world. So open to questions. Thank you so much um, for your mentorship and teaching, Dr. Hussein. I agree. This is a definitely incredibly powerful talk and you're right disparities tend to be shown as black and white data but being able to see the stories of Moloch and and other children that you showed and the comparisons living in a first world country and then and the unfortunate scenario the 93 percent data I did not know before I know that I've also been uh, published with um, medically underserved areas and have these places where I've always been aware of disparity but I've never really seen it uh, in, 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 these, in, in, this, in this light. So we'll be splitting up our Q&A session with kind of on your talk, and then we'll, we'll start off with questions about the anatomy, physiology, day in your life, if that's okay with you. Yeah, you bet. Awesome. So to start off um, our Q&A, what inspired you to pursue medicine in the first place? Um, uh, you'll learn through this Q&A that uh, a lot of my answers aren't gonna be that exciting or romantic, but they'll be truthful. Um, I, I think, as some of you may or may not relate, you know, I grew up in a pretty um, uh, structured family environment and, you know, some form of educational focus and goal definition was imparted upon us. I've got two siblings from a pretty early age. Um, not that medicine was a focus. Um, at least at that time in my life, I didn't have any family members that were physicians. <coughs> my dad, uh, father taught pharmacology. So there was some science background and I went into high school and college, I think having an interest in medicine, but not being committed or focused on it, did some shadowing, um, and found an interest in healthcare, went to college, had, uh, a lot of interest originally about pursuing law, but um, <clears throat> I must admit, struggled a little bit about some of the morality and some of the realities of what um, life as a lawyer might be. And so um, there was no magical moment, no life altering experience, but um, I think just kind of an organic evolution in terms of an interest in medicine. Thank you so much. And speaking of your journey, so where did you complete your residency and fellowship? So I did um, five years of general surgery residency at the University of Iowa. I did two years of cardiothoracic research to follow that. And then I did two years of an adult cardiothoracic fellowship at the University of North Carolina. And then I did a one year pediatric or congenital cardiac surgical fellowship at Riley Children's Hospital in Indianapolis. So would you say that is um, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years after medical school of training? Mm -hmm. yep. that, that's amazing. That's, uh, I know that that's something that a lot of students are, you know, usually going for the three, three year, five year residencies, but it's definitely you know, something you're passionate about. So that's exciting to hear that, that you never got burnt out or how did you manage that? Um, it was tough. Um, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> our requirements and some of the rules and regulations regarding training have changed. I feel a little bit dated in what I'm about to share and it's not embellishing any of it. It's just, again, a reality of how it was for the first three years of my general surgery training, you were on call every other night in the hospital. And so you essentially would finish up 
at five or six, six or seven, you'd get to go home and sleep. And then you'd be in the hospital for 36 hours. And so that was essentially three straight years of that. Um, you know, I will tell you in retrospect, I think oftentimes you think back about things fondly. It was a lot of hard work. It was very demanding. Um, it inherently created a work ethic just predicated on how much you had to work in terms of creating that um, consistency in terms of your approach. But in many ways, it was some of the most fond years I've had in medicine in my life, probably for the following reasons. One, there's a lot of collegiality and camaraderie. You really became very good friends with your fellow residents because you were going through something very difficult together. And it was a time in life where you got to be very active in healthcare, but you weren't necessarily the last responsible party. You didn't have to make the critical decision. You had an attending. You didn't have to make that repair stitch. You didn't have to do really all of the acutely life altering critical things. You had attending physicians that were your safety net. It's not to say that you weren't doing a lot. You did a lot of operating but you always did it in the presence of someone else. And so that transition from 10 years of training into doing it on your own was very stark. And you don't really realize that transition until you make it because it forces you to reflect upon what residency training was really like, which was a lot of hard work, a lot of repetition, a lot of demands, a big sacrifice, but at the same time, one that was done under the protective watch of someone who actually at the end of the day was responsible. Thank you. That's really enlightening for me because I just applied to medical school and just graduated college. So yeah, I've been thinking of different specialties, different types of training, and you know, I'm, I'm still open to surgery. Uh, so even though it sounds like, oh, it's 10 years after medical school. So thank you so much for, for that insight. I really appreciate it. Um, and so switching gears a bit to your experience in Palestine and Gaza, um, have you ever lost power in the Gaza Strip during surgery? And if so, what did you do? Or did you always have backup generators? We always have generators because, you know, it's, it'd be a life-threatening thing to not have the pump work. <clears throat> but, you know, even the generators need to be charged. And so there's a very thoughtful interplay in terms of deciding which generator you use when you're comfortable to proceed and whatnot. But no, never have had power go out in the middle of an operation without some type of backup. Okay, that, that's great to know. Thank you. And um, what is one of the most difficult experiences you've had um, either in, in the surgery? Like what is, uh, do you have any stories to share in, in terms of maybe a very difficult case where you had to make some decisions um, that may not have worked out for you in the end? Well, I think anytime um, we do complex surgery in a foreign place, it can be very um, disconcerting. Um, you know, I think the best way that I could try to give you an analogy is um, it'd be like trying to make a really fancy meal, but having to be in a kitchen that you've never been in where you don't know where anything is and you didn't get to do the grocery shopping. So you have to do it, you know, from whatever's in the fridge. It's like those reality shows where you're basically asked to make something, but you have to figure it out. And so it can be very tough to do really complex operations. That being said, now having gone several times, you have some general understanding of instruments and people and how to make things work. Um, I think one thing that just came to mind randomly to me when you asked that question is <clears throat> we use temperature to our advantage in operating rooms here in the U.S. So if we're doing a really small baby that needs to go on the bypass machine for a long period of time, we'll actually make the baby very cold. And we do that because their uh, metabolic rate and, and organ uh, uh, needs go quite down in a state of being cold. And that's not possible in Gaza because there is no ability to control temperatures in the operating room. And so um, you finish cases drenched in sweat because usually the rooms get very warm. And um, that can create a sense of significant discomfort while you're doing a, a very long operation. So, you know, there's all sorts of variables. Um, we don't have sometimes the optimized uh, surgical equipment. Sometimes we struggle with some of the medications that we need and then we try to bring them over and then we're not allowed to bring them into the country. And so uh, the, the list is pretty long of all the different variables of challenge that one can face, but 
I would say that um, we always try to find a way to figure it out. And uh, the, the joy that you get in terms of getting a good outcome in spite of all of these challenges, I think makes that joy a little bit even more significant. Thank you, Dr. Hussain. And uh, speaking of it, when you mentioned the uh, a new kitchen, the analogy that you mentioned, um, how do you usually adjust the adult ORs to accommodate for pediatric ORs? I know you touched on that a little bit. Um, uh, most of it is just equipment things. Um, uh, a lot of the monitoring things, the cables that we need, um, the, the surgical instruments that we need. Um, so most of it is just... Um, hardware and software, uh, if I had to use kind of broad stroke terms, so. Thank you. And I guess um, my last question regarding Gaza um, would be, have you ever, you, have you ever um, has your work also ever involved advocacy? Because I know that a lot of physicians nowadays are getting involved in politics and having these important conversations regarding healthcare because the World Health Organization has told us that healthcare is a fundamental human right. So what are your thoughts? No, I, I think, um, you know, I've over the years become a lot more involved with leadership within the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund and, um, you know, evaluating how we can work better with the Ministry of Health there to create a more sustained approach towards funds flow in regards to um, charitable dollars getting to the right places so that equipment can be purchased and we can get the right types of people hired locally to help with not just the evolution of local healthcare providers, but also the logistics of teams coming in. Um, yes, have had um, some interactions with um, you know governmental officials in terms of easing some of the restrictions. You know, I think again, the sad reality is we're never going to be able to have enough teams go into a place like Gaza. To take care of all the needs so we have to be concurrently thoughtful about how do we get kids out how do we create collaborative partnerships so that kids who need surgery or need some type of say chemotherapy or other care can exit gaza safely and go to a place either in the west bank or in tel aviv for care and so those are ongoing discussions those are ongoing challenges and so yes i would um I would concur that evolving into advocacy and actually getting involved with things that aren't necessarily happening in the operating room, but perhaps more on a governmental level is very valuable. Thank you, Dr. Hussain. I'm now going to pass it off to Amira to include our Q&A session for today. My name is Amira and um, I'm a senior at the University of Maryland. And now we're going to sort of delve into some more medical questions. Um, so first off, um, one of our questions is, why does the human heart have only one bicuspid mitral valve and three tricuspid valves? I couldn't tell you, but you're absolutely right. The mitral valve is the only valve that is not tricuspid. Um, I don't know that there is a physiologic reason for that. Um, I'll delve into a few things that some of you probably already know that doesn't answer the question, but just spark some thoughts in my mind. So the mitral and aortic valve are systemic valves, meaning they deal with systemic pressure. The tricuspid and pulmonary valves are, I would say, pulmonary valves in the sense that they deal with much lower pressures. I don't know necessarily that three versus two leaflets matter. What matters more is the functionality of the leaflets. It's interesting, uh, the tricuspid and mitral valve have significant subvalvar apparatus within their anatomy, meaning they have cords that connect the leaflets to papillary muscles that are embedded within the ventricular wall. So right-sided papillary muscles in the RV wall with cords that go to the tricuspid valve leaflets left-sided papillary muscles that are embedded within the LV wall that through chordal apparatus go to the mitral valve leaflets. The semilunar valves, the aortic and pulmonary valve have no cords. They are just free floating leaflets and their functionality is entirely predicated on pressure differences. So in many regards, I think the reasons why valves require interventions are different 
depending upon whether they're a semilunar valve or an atrioventricular valve, meaning whether they're an aortic or pulmonary valve versus a mitral or a tricuspid valve. Because oftentimes with mitral and tricuspid valves, the issue has to do with some chordal problem or a papillary muscle problem. Whereas with an aortic or pulmonary valve, it's leaflet. Whether it be a bicuspid aortic valve, whether it be some type of uh, commissural problem, meaning where the leaflets join isn't actually anatomically correct. So there's some degree of stenosis or insufficiency. So um, I guess without answering your question, what I would tell you is even after all these years, I don't know that it matters that a valve has two or three leaflets. I think what matters is how are the cords, how are the pap muscles, and how are the leaflets themselves for the AV valves? And then how are the leaflets and the architecture of the annulus and the commissures for the semilunar valves? Okay, thank you so much. And our next question is, um, what would happen during a mitral valve replacement if a prosthetic tricuspid valve was used instead of the usual bicuspid valve? Um, nothing. Um, it, it would be more dependent on ensuring that the valve seated correctly and um, ensuring that the leaflets aren't impinged upon by any subvalvular issue. But um, for example, we can flip an aortic valve to use in the mitral position if we had to, meaning the architecture of the valve is really irrelevant. It's more how the valve is seated and how the leaflets are functioning. Okay, thank you so much. And our next question is, what are some common complications that you can face as a heart surgeon during pediatric procedures? Um, it really depends on the operation. Um, you know, I think the sad reality is any operation can have death or stroke as a major complication. The phrenic nerve uh, is a nerve that runs alongside the pericardial reflection on each side of the mediastinum. And irritation to those nerves can result in diaphragmatic paralysis or paresis, which can impact your respiratory mechanics. The recurrent laryngeal nerve runs right underneath the ductus and the aorta. And so a lot of these babies who need arch reconstructions or have aortic pathology were operating near the, duct, the, uh, the, the ductus and the arch. And so very near the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which impacts the left vocal cord for swallowing mechanics and for phonation. Um, rhythm disturbances. Anytime we operate it inside the heart or around the heart, we could injure the conduction system or irritate the electrical system of the heart, rendering the heart to require a pacemaker for heart block or require pharmacologic manipulation if it's actually a tachyarrhythmia or some type of supraventricular tachycardia. So rhythm disturbances would be another. Oftentimes we're putting patches inside the heart or using patches to reconstruct components of the heart. So scarring uh, long-term requiring uh, the need for some type of re-intervention is a possibility. So I think Without being scripted, these would be some of the complications that would come to mind on first pass. Thank you so much. And finally, for our last question, how do you manage your work-life balance? Uh, uh, it's uh, a, an evolving, ongoing process. Um, it's tough. I think um, every stage of life brings about a different perspective. I would readily admit um, that doing this for a profession has likely altered my psychology, my personality, my makeup as an individual in a way that is really um, significant. And I am thoughtful about that every day, but I wouldn't necessarily say perfect about that every day. And what am I, what I'm saying is, um, being a pediatric heart surgeon, operating on babies, having parents that rely on you, that trust you, that are very committed and dependent upon you creates an inherent work-life imbalance because if a baby's not doing well in the hospital that you operated upon or a baby in the hospital needs something, it's very hard to find anything else that takes priority over that. And you have to have a pretty patient family and set of kids and close circle around you that understands that. I also think that your expectations of life are unfair. You know, we work in an environment every day where everything has to be perfect. 
And if it's not perfect, you're criticized, you're critiqued, you're judged, you're evaluated, you're graded, you're scored. Um, you know, all of our outcomes for surgery are transparently <clears throat> published online. That's just the way society is now. And so it's hard sometimes as an individual to live in that environment, but then at the end of the day, leave that environment and not have unrealistic expectations of everything else in your life and not feel as if everything else should be judged the way you're being judged. And I think that you have to have the ability to not only acknowledge that difficulty, but work at it. Um, you know, life is filled with imperfections, uh, whether they be just efficiency imperfections, um, appearance imperfections, and it's very hard to flip your OCD switch to off when you leave work because you can't live life like that outside the hospital the way you're demanded to live it inside the hospital. Um, and my kids are getting older. I think my perspective on things for a lot of personal reasons continues to evolve. Um, I would say in the first half of my career, embarrassingly, maybe at times, uh, I felt like my self-worth was defined by how I operated and how families were happy and how colleagues respected me. And I felt like that concept of purpose was probably in an unhealthy way for me defined by being a pediatric heart surgeon. And I think as you get a bit older, your kids get a bit older, you come to some realizations in life, you have some regrets about your work-life balance and how you've managed a lot of very different aspects of your life. You realize that really, is that what defines me? Is that really my self-worth? If I decide not to go up that next rung on the ladder of my professional trajectory, is that gonna mean that I'm less important of a person or less valuable of a person or less smart? Probably not. So it's, it's a work in progress. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Hussain, um, for such an amazing session. Um, that's the end of our Q&A session, so I'll pass it back to Minahil now. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Hussain. We really appreciate you taking the time to answer all of our questions and taking the time out of your day to mentor us. So I'd love everyone to please give a warm thank you to Dr. Hussain in the chat box for this incredibly informative session. Thank you. I'm available. Um, I think you all have my email address. If you have somebody in your group that has an innate interest in cardiac surgery or pediatric cardiac surgery or uh, would want any type of follow-up, I'm happy to do this type of lecture again. So I appreciate the opportunity. It was really uh, a great experience and apologies for not being able to do it on Saturday. Thank you very much, Dr. Hussain. Now we're going to conduct our closing session <clears throat> with our quiz and future session dates. So the link to the quiz for the session is now live. And again, you will need a 70% or higher to pass and receive certification. And that link is being sent in the chat now. So now on to our next session dates. These dates will also be posted throughout our social media outlets. So be sure to follow us at Teleshadowing. And our next session will be next Saturday, June 25th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with our student panel mm -hmm. talking about the medical school applications process. Thank you so much everyone for attending today's session and we hope to see you in upcoming sessions as well. This concludes this week's shadowing session. Thank you. Thank you.